The Day Glow Brothers. The true story of Bob and Joe Switzer's bright ideas and brand new colors. Written by Chris Barton. Illustrated by Tony Persiani. Even if they'd wanted to, the ancient Egyptians couldn't have painted their pyramids a green that glowed in the desert sun. Back in 2600 BCE, there was no such color. A glowing orange Statue of Liberty might have made coming to America even more memorable. But when Lady Liberty was assembled in 1886, that color wasn't an option. And in 1920, if young Bob and Joe Switzer had thought their family's Montana cottage would look better with a yellow glow, they would have been out of luck too. But not for long. After all, it was the Switzer brothers themselves who would soon bring those eye-popping yellows, oranges, and greens into the world. It would just take a few bright ideas. The Switzer brothers' illuminating tale begins with Bob, born in 1914. <laughs> From early on, Bob loved to work. He earned money shoveling snow, picking beets, and using a souped-up Model T Ford to round up wild horses. Bob wasn't just a worker. He was a planner, too. One summer, he saved his money to pay for a ride in the open cockpit of a stunt plane at the fair in Billings. Joe, younger by 15 months, exerted himself a lot less than his older brother. Practicing magic tricks was more his speed. With his knack for sleight of hand, he made metal rings and playing cards seem to disappear and reappear. Joe also had a problem-solving streak. His dad had kidney trouble and a bad back, so Joe rigged a mirror allowing Mr. Switzer to lie down at the back of his drugstore and still watch for customers coming through the front door. A long drought brought hard times to Montana, so in 1931 the family moved to Berkeley, California, where Mr. Switzer had bought a pharmacy. In Berkeley, Joe began wowing crowds with magic shows at school and church. His act included a kind of illusion called black art. Black art involved an object, painted half black and half white, that seemed to float and then disappear when held and turned under a white spotlight in front of a black background. It was a nifty trick, but Joe wished he could make it even better. While Joe was set on showbiz, Bob wanted to be a doctor. Doctors made good money, he reckoned, and like pharmacists, they help people be healthy. After graduating from high school in 1932, Bob won a scholarship to a university near home. In 1933, Bob took a summer job inspecting railroad cars at a gigantic pickle and ketchup factory. One day, when Bob was climbing into a car full of ketchup bottles, the barricade he was standing on collapsed. Bob fell about 12 feet and hit his head on the concrete loading dock. The fall gave Bob seizures and double vision. It damaged his memory and ended his plan to become a doctor. Bob had to spend several months at home healing in the darkened basement. Joe was down there too, but for a different reason. He was in the dark so he could think about light. Joe had read in popular science about ultraviolet lamps, also called black lights, which made certain substances glow in the dark. Joe knew this glow, called fluorescence, could jazz up his magic act. The dim basement where Bob was stuck recovering seemed like the perfect place to experiment. Bob was bored and eager to help. Together, the brothers built their own ultraviolet lamp. One night, they took it into their dad's drugstore. In the darkened storeroom, they aimed the light at the bottles and boxes on the shelves. There in the dark, the chemical-stained label on a bottle of eyewash emitted a yellow glow. Bob and Joe scrounged around the university and other local labs for additional fluorescent materials. When they got a hold of some, say, uranium or anthracene, they ground them with their father's mortar and pestle. 
Then they secretly use their mother's new kitchen mixer to combine the powders with alcohol, shellac, or other ingredients. The results? Splattering, gooey, glowing paints. And once, when Miss Switzer surprised them before they could clean all the paint out of the mixer, a peculiar looking angel food cake. But Bob and Joe had a bigger problem the sun. The effect of the ultraviolet light was impossible to see in daylight. Plus, the sunlight faded the paint so they wouldn't glow at night either. So much for Joe and Bob using their paints in store windows. While they were wrong about that idea, Joe was right about how fluorescence could boost his magic act. In his Balinese dancer illusion, a woman wore a fluorescent painted paper costume. While she cavorted on a stage lit only by an ultraviolet lamp, Joe, unseen by the audience, yanked off her headdress. The dancer went one way and her head went the other. It was a gruesome effect, but it won first prize at a magician's convention and made the newspaper. Word got around and soon Joe and Bob had lots of customers. The Warfield Theater bought fluorescent costumes that made chorus girls look like wiggling skeletons. The toy department at Hale Brothers featured a glow in the dark Christmas display. Spiritualists used the brothers' paint to trick gullible customers into thinking they were seeing ghosts of their dearly departed loved ones. A printer in Cleveland, Ohio, began using the Switzer Boys' fluorescent ink to make posters for movie theaters. Like the rest of Joe and Bob's creations, the ink in those posters was used mostly inside and glowed only under ultraviolet light. But one day in May 1935, while Joe was away drumming up more business, Bob made a curious discovery. He had dipped some silk fabric samples in a boiling combination of alcohol and fluorescent dye. Then he hung the samples in the backyard to see whether sunlight would fade this latest concoction. A little while later, Bob was in the front yard when something caught his eye. Even at that distance, and in ordinary daylight, he could see that the fabric in the backyard was glowing. What had caused this? The alcohol, the dye, the boiling, the silk? Bob didn't know, and with a million things on their minds, he and Joe didn't have time to figure out the answer. Not right then, anyway. Soon the brothers decided to focus on their big customers back east and leave Berkeley behind. With new suits, $90, and a back seat full of fluorescent inks and paints, Bob and Joe drove off to Ohio on New Year's Day, 1936. There, they settled in Cleveland and earned a living by providing colors for fluorescent posters. But they also kept chasing after better colors and new ideas, each brother in his own way. Bob was a morning person, and Joe liked the night. Joe might wrap up his work and hit the hay not long before Bob awoke to begin his research. Bob focused on specific goals while Joe let his freewheeling mind roam every which way when he tried to solve a problem. If just one experiment out of a thousand succeeds, Joe would say, then you're ahead of the game. For Bob and Joe, the tough times of the Great Depression meant living and experimenting on the cheap. When Bob got married in 1936, his wife moved into the apartment the brothers were sharing. Patricia let Bob borrow her shiny satin wedding dress and that was the last time she saw it in one piece. Aww. After Joe got married in 1938, he and his wife, Elise, moved into a run-down old farmhouse so he would have room for his own laboratory. It wasn't the best place for a young family, as their baby boy liked to chew on chemical-splattered shoes. <laughs> but Bob and Joe's efforts paid off brilliantly. One day, they drove out to the city of Sandusky to check on a new billboard they had developed. Instead of using ink, they had soaked the billboard's fabric panels with a combination of fluorescent orange dye and hot alcohol. If the dye didn't fade too quickly, 
the ultraviolet lamps on the billboard would make for an eye-grabbing nighttime display. When the billboard came into view that afternoon, what the brothers saw astonished them. From more than a mile away, it looked like the billboard was on fire. When they got up close, the Switzers didn't find any flames. Instead, they discovered something even more exciting. It was just like those silk samples Bob had seen in his backyard in Berkeley. Even without the ultraviolet light on, the billboard was glowing, glowing bright orange in the setting sun. By accident, Joe and Bob had invented a totally new color. To their amazement, it glowed in both daylight and ultraviolet light. They called this new color fire orange, and Joe used their newfound know-how to create other colors, glowing reds, yellows, greens, and more. Meanwhile, Bob looked for ways these day glow colors could be used. World War II provided lots of them. Day glow fabric panels were used to send signals from the ground that could be seen by an airplane 10,000 feet in the air. Survivors of disasters at sea used the panels in lifeboats to improve their chances of getting rescued. Day glow buoys marked areas in the water that had been cleared of floating explosives called mines. Aircraft carrier crews clad in day glow suits lit by ultraviolet lamps guided planes to nighttime landings. In small but certain ways, the Switzer's inventions helped the United States and its allies win the war. After the war, Bob and Joe's colors made them rich. Day glow began to brighten everyday life back home. The colors made their way onto gas station signs and detergent boxes, traffic cones and magazine covers, including Joe's old favorite, Popular Science. Artist Andy Warhol used them in his famous paintings. From life jackets to dump trucks, golf balls to goalposts, hula hoops to hunting vests, Joe and Bob's creations kept glowing and glowing. When they were growing up, Bob and Joe Switzer wanted different things. Bob wanted to make his fortune by becoming a doctor, and Joe wanted to make his mark on the world through magic. At first, it may seem that neither brother ended up where he wanted to be. But in that darkened basement, the Switzer brothers began to look at the world in a different light. One brother wanted to save lives, the other brother wanted to dazzle crowds. With day glow, they did both. The end. <laughs>